story of Upbuild began in a monastery. On our quest to understand ourselves more deeply, we recognize that it is our attachment to our egos, our identities, that gets in the way of being our true selves. This podcast will help you understand your ego. It will help you better understand your inner world, the motivations, insecurities, and emotions that affect your every action and relationship. Welcome to Upbuilding the Self. Hello, everyone, and hello, Razana. So I want to get us started today by orienting us around the question, is it okay to be angry? Is it okay to be angry? And the inspiration for this topic came from a metaphor that you shared at a recent Upbuild program, comparing anger to a medicine that has a little bit of poison in it as one of its key ingredients. And I was wondering if you could start by unpacking that metaphor for us and sharing how it relates to this question of, is it okay to be angry? Thank you. I I appreciate how you picked up on that one comment and are helping to expand on that because I think the topic of anger is a very complex topic, and especially in the times that we live in and what we have experienced in the last four or five years in this country, across the world, even before that, but especially in the last four or five years. To understand the emotion of anger can be very helpful to know how to use it. And this, going back to what you said, is it okay to be angry? I think the response to that is yes, (laughs) very simply, because anger, just like so many emotions, is an emotion. And there are circumstances and situations where we will experience it. We don't have a choice, but it will just surface. It will come. The question is, how do we use it? Because anger as an emotion has a certain destructive component to it if it's not used properly. So the broader question that we have to ask, going back to the analogy that you gave about anger being like a medicine with some poison in it, if you don't have a doctor or a physician who knows exactly how to administer the medicine to know how much to inject and how to do it properly for a patient, then it can be destructive. What really struck me about that metaphor was that most of us think that we are professionally trained doctors when administering this emotion, when administering anger, because we're so familiar with it. We've, we've spent so much time being angry. At least I can speak very personally is I spend way more time than I'd like to admit that feeling angry and feeling angry at myself, feeling angry at other people, feeling angry at the world. And so it's so familiar to me. And so I think there's a confidence that develops that I actually know how to use it. And then time and time again, I'm proven wrong because I see the collateral damage that comes about pretty much any time that I do use it. And I'm almost never using it in the correct way. So in, in when we discuss anger, there are also various degrees of, uh, I would say, righteousness attached to it. <laughs> and when I use the word righteous, typically what comes to mind is self-righteous. And many times we can be angry from a place of feeling self-righteous. And then there is also a place for anger where, for example, someone has been denied a basic right or you see someone being abused. It is, there are places where anger is necessary in order to bring about change. Because if looking at that situation didn't bring an emotion of anger to us, there is something, there's something desensitized about, about those experiences. And then for some reason, we feel like those extreme circumstances where when we experience abuse or we see abuse or we see something being done unfairly to someone or to our own selves, somehow that experience gets extended to so many other aspects of life, which are not that severe, really. 
Right. So when we discuss anger, it's important to also understand where in the grayscale does the situation actually fall. And bringing this point to the ego, and at Upbuild, we talk so much about the ego. The ego can feel pretty angry when it's denied anything. It can be as simple as standing in a line and you're expecting that the line will move fast. <laughs> and feeling upset about the fact that the line is not moving fast enough. The ego loves to use the phrase, it's not fair. Yes. <laughs> and it's not fair, just like you mentioned, can be on a huge spectrum. It can be, it's not fair because somebody said they were going to do something and they didn't do it. And it's right. And, I, and I'm right. It's not fair. The person said they were going to do something and they didn't do it. And so now I'm left with the consequences. And then there's on the other end, as you said, it's not fair. Somebody was denied a basic human right. And that really is not fair. And so being able to tell the difference, having the wisdom to tell the difference is so critical. Yeah, absolutely. So the example that you gave about somebody promising something and not following through on it, you know, there is a reason why a certain expectation was set and you were expecting a certain result. And then you didn't get the result. And naturally, there is, you're upset. There is anger. Now, there are many times where, and this goes back to uh, Michael, the article that you wrote about unilateral contracts and how we build these unilateral contracts and the other person in the contract in that relationship doesn't even know that they actually signed up for the relationship. And then they experience our anger. And this happens to me on a day-to-day -day basis <laughs> where I become attached to a certain result where I expect that people will show up in a way. And when I use the word I, I would say my ego is attached to certain outcomes, even when they have not been explicitly defined. And when those outcomes are not reached, I become upset at the situation. I become angry at the situation. And the ego, for the ego, it's very easy for the ego to feel it's not fair. And the reason for that is the ego, by definition, brings a tremendous sense of entitlement. So anger is, uh, has a, if you look at the causality of it, we can actually see that anger comes from the denial of something that I feel I deserve. Anger comes from the denial of something that I feel I deserve. Yeah. So let's say we're talking about an example where we're, where we're talking about a sense of entitlement, not a basic human right, but a sense of entitlement that our ego feels. So we're on the part of the scale where anger is probably not that helpful of an emotion. And yet I'm still feeling angry. I'm pissed. I had an example come up a few weeks ago where I hired a lawyer. This was to help with the immigration process of a family member. And I found out that he had made an administrative error a long time ago that cost us many months in this immigration process. And when I found out, I was pissed, like super, super pissed. <laughs> And on one hand, I was right. <laughs> I hired this person to do something and they didn't do it or they made a mistake that cost us a big amount of time. And yet, as I saw the situation unfold and I got angry at him, I got angry at somebody else that worked for his firm that certainly didn't deserve to be the recipient of my anger. It wasn't helpful. It was very, it was whatever the opposite of helpful was, that was, it was destructive. So I'm wondering if we could maybe unpack this situation a bit. What would be a more helpful response? And how can I get to a place where I can still feel my anger, but it doesn't have to drive me? It's a great question. And I think we all can use the exercising of stimulus and response here. And the reason why anger is such, a, such an important emotion to discuss is from the moment we feel anger to its expression can be a very, very short duration. It's like an explosive energy. It surges into the body very, very quickly and has to find an outlet very, very quickly because of which it makes it such a powerful and yet a very difficult emotion to manage. 
So to start exploring your question a little more, many times our response to anger is twofold. And this is coming from my own personal experience as well. It either comes from a place of feeling super justified to express it almost immediately, or it comes, the other response to anger is, I shouldn't be this. I shouldn't be feeling this. And so so the response is to suppress the anger. And in either case, we actually find it is not helpful. So I think the place to start is by acknowledging that I'm feeling angry. You don't have to actually give the reason. Typically, we go to the, we, we, again, uh, going to what I said about the two initial responses to anger, either we feel justified or we feel that we need to suppress it. The reason why that is the case is we find many times when we are angry, in our minds, we will see how we have to justify our anger. Because we know deep down that anger is an emotion that tends to hurt someone. And so the reason why we have to go to a place of justification is we feel justified. We can't hurt somebody unless we feel justified. You see how the explosive nature of anger has to find a cause, uh, has to be able to point to a cause in order for it to release. And it, it's so tricky. It's a temptress almost. It's like you will solve your problem if you just follow me. And it's this like beautiful person who's promising all the riches of the world. And every single time it's like mouth wide open, just following this person into this promised land. And there's really nothing there in the end. It's interesting you use the word because wisdom text, specifically the Bhagavad Gita talks about anger as the next door neighbor to attachment. (laughs) So uh, when we become attached to a certain outcome, there are only two ways in which it can go. Either it's fulfilled or it's not fulfilled. When it's fulfilled, it doesn't end there. And specifically, the wisdom texts use the word, the Gita uses the word lust. So when lust is satisfied, it becomes greed. When it's dissatisfied, it becomes anger. And again, when we think about lust, the ego is by nature, that's why we use the word entitled. (laughs) The ego by nature is lusty. That's the experience. The ego just is all consuming and wants to be, when 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 we use the word lust, there is a certain gusto about that emotion. And that's how the ego shows up. It wants to consume everything for its purpose. So naturally, when that is denied, we are going to experience anger. Now, again, there is a spectrum here that we have to keep in mind. So going back to the thread around feeling justified, I think what's important here is for us to step back. And this is why when we, first is to acknowledge that I'm angry without without feeling a need to say because, (laughs) or without feeling a need to actually say, no, that is a wrong thing to do or a wrong thing to feel without passing any judgment around that emotion to be able to actually say, I am feeling angry right now. And in the acknowledgement of that emotion, you will see the temperature of it decreases. Sometimes it's also helpful to call up someone and say, I'm feeling really angry right now and I need someone (laughs) to help me manage this emotion. (laughs) It's really helpful to talk through acknowledge and talk through the emotion of anger, because in acknowledging and talking through it, it brings down the charge around the emotion. What I'm also seeing here is that it's important to get to the nuance underneath the anger itself. And so why am I angry? What actually is the emotion that's underneath the anger that is the thing that I don't want to feel because anger feels so good. It feels so powerful. It, it's like I can fix whatever I feel justified to change. But there's something else that's lurking underneath, which is maybe not as empowering of an emotion. Maybe it can be a very deflating emotion like shame or loneliness or an insecurity. So it's not about the anger itself, but it's about not feeling those things. 
which the anger allows me to get. So we often, Hari, our partner, Hari Prasad, often talks about the Gabor Mate talk, the power of addiction, where he asks, don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. Exactly. It's such a good way to look at it. And the corollary here is don't ask why the anger, but ask what is the emotion that's underneath the anger that I don't want to feel? And let's actually deal with that. It's so good. Anger is a symptom of something, right? Anger is a symptom of an unmet need that was expected. So uh, what will be so important here, and this is true for a lot of emotions, but specifically for anger. Anger is, if you were to think about emotions, anger is an emotion that's in front of perhaps another emotion, right? And so it would be helpful to go into that underlying emotion of what has been unmet here and how does that make you feel? So like, for example, in in the case of your example, when you said you talked about this lawyer, there was a sense of like, hey, we agreed to this and I have been following your lead. But if you don't do your part, I am left hanging. The underlying emotion here is, I would say, of a sense of feeling, I wouldn't necessarily use the word hurt, but there is a sense of letdown. I would say helpless. Actually, now that we're talking about it, all these emotions are like becoming much more clear to me. Helplessness is very much there. It's like, I can't, the system is against me. And like, this guy was supposed to be my one connection to some sort of help in the system and he failed. And then a sense of shame too, because I was the one who had chosen this person. And like, I I failed my family member and my family members who now don't get to see us for a long time because of what happened. And also a feeling of loneliness because now I don't get to experience my family's company for quite some time. And so all of those things, the shame, the loneliness, the helplessness, those were what was underneath. But in the moment, all I wanted to feel was the anger. Right. So powerful. Thank you for sharing that. It's In this case, it felt like you trusted someone. And when someone lets down your trust, you feel like a fool. There is a shame there. You feel like, well, I should have seen this coming and I couldn't see this coming. So there is also some self-directed anger. But, you know, uh, it's what will you do with self-directed anger? People do a lot of things with self-directed anger, but typically what we do is even that self-directed anger eventually then gets directed at the other person. So there are these underlying emotions of feeling violated in some way. And it would be very helpful to understand, but what is the violation that just happened? And sometimes that violation can be legitimate in the sense that somebody actually violated it. And sometimes the violation was completely like the other person was not intending to do it. (laughs) The other person didn't even realize that there was an expectation placed on me and I let you, I I didn't even know that. And sometimes the, the, the violation may happen because despite our best attempts, we as humans are flawed, right? So as we look at the violation, it's also important to understand, well, what What led to the violation? Was it deliberate? Was it carelessness? Or was it it just a a lack of understanding on the other side? Or was there a genuine reason? So the hierarchy here is underneath an anger is a violation. That violation gives rise to a bunch of emotions. Let down, shame, loneliness, helplessness. There is a bunch of emotions. So we have to acknowledge all of those emotions behind the anger. And then underlying those emotions, then it's also important to recognize, well, why did that violation take place? And to be able to see now we come to a place where we can hopefully, because we have acknowledged our emotions, we might be in a place where we can then analyze, well, what, why did the violation happen? And so this is not about letting other people off the hook. We're not here saying, take your anger work on it and figure it out and then don't ever hold people accountable for the things that they need to be held accountable for. No, this is about coming from a place where we can see things much more clearly. We can understand other people's intentions. We can understand what we ourselves are going through 
and then respond from that place, which will be much more productive than if we don't have an understanding of what's going on underneath the surface. Absolutely, absolutely. And at that point in time, the anger is very well directed. It's channeled. It's actually, it really, it really knows how to express itself. Uh, many times we see when there is expression of anger, there is usually sarcasm. There is also a lot of guilt that accompanies anger. I've experienced this myself and also... I've heard a lot of people talk about when they, after they release anger, they feel really bad about what they did. And now they have to justify their anger even more and deal with the guilt around it. But when we follow the process of really understanding the emotion behind the anger, the cause of the violation, there is a way in which we can have a conversation with another person, or we can perhaps go back into the situation where we felt violated and be able to express our position from a place of clarity and can also ask for what needs to change here and even dictate the consequences, right? So uh, there is a way in which we can hold the other person accountable. And again, it depends on where the other person was coming from. If the other person was doing his or her best, but then still couldn't meet what was agreed upon, there is a very different way in which we might have to approach that situation versus when somebody actually was just careless. So uh, there is an element of accountability here at the end of it that needs to be exercised, which is where I find personally the, a very well-directed use of the F, anger. There has to be consequence if someone is neglectful or careless or just outrightly like, you know, deliberate <laughs> about neglect or violating. We have to be able to go back and spell out consequences. But we, when we have processed our anger, the way we can show up there is just so much more powerful and clear. And there is strength to that exercising of anger that everybody can experience. We can ask ourselves a question beforehand. What result, now that this has happened, what result do I really want here? And then we can be a cause in the matter of making that happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Whereas if we just are following our anger, the result that we want is almost always for the other person to share in the pain that we were experiencing that caused us to feel the anger in the first place. So when I called up that lawyer and for all intents and purposes, let him have it, I wanted him to feel that same feeling of shame and that same feeling of loneliness and helplessness that I had felt. But I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's possible to bring that person into, instead of actually making the person feel your shame, you can actually help the person understand how you felt. You know, see the consequences of your neglect or see the consequences of your carelessness. This is, this is what I have to go through, Right. It's okay to, to help the person understand that without making the other person feel the same way. And sometimes, sometimes and this is, again, very, it has to be, again, this goes back to the example that you said, it's a medicine that has to be administered very, very carefully. Sometimes it may be necessary to make the person feel some pain. But here is where the caveat is, and this is so critical, it's so important to understand. We can't do that effectively if we are coming from a place of revenge. If we want the person to change, then we administer that in a way that really brings the change. But it has to come from a place of caring for the other person as well. If it comes purely from a place of revenge, then that is that just just has destructive consequences both for that other person but also for ourselves the aftermath of anger is never a pleasant experience right it stays in our bloodstream too it's not that it's gone <laughs> but if it's done very carefully and thoughtfully we see that the anger doesn't stay in our bloodstream because of the amount of awareness that has been developed around the process that we undertook to work through the anger and to express it in a constructive way, the aftermath of that anger is, is strength <laughs> versus the aftermath of that anger being disturbance. That's the difference when it can be administered very, very effectively. 
That's so helpful. And most of us need to remember, most of us need to have the humility to know that we're not professionally trained anger doctors. And we should probably err on the side of caution rather than thinking that we know what dose to be able to administer. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Razanath. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for listening to Upbuilding the Self. Upbuild is a leadership development company that offers workshops, coaching, and other services to help you on the path towards being your best self, free from the shackles of the ego. To learn more about our work, visit our website, upbuild.com, and sign up for our newsletter to gain access to podcasts, reflections, and upcoming events. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes to leave us a review so that others can find and benefit from the podcast. We look forward to being with you again next time.